Welcome to Around the Weird. Here's your host, the museum curator of the strange and unusual, Mr. Nothing. Thank you, Mysterious Voice, and welcome back to Around the Weird, a booktube channel where I talk about all the unusual and out of the ordinary literature that I have found in my travels. Today, I want to talk about a book that I've read, uh, a book that has actually been on my TBR list for the uh, for the year, um, and also is a Newbery Medal winner. Um, something that I've wanted to explore more is those Newbery Medals, uh, see like how great they are, and like what information really, what what themes, what ideas are we pa- being passed on to uh, young adults? Uh, because it's it's always good to check in with uh, young adult fiction. Uh, in that regard. Uh, And so today's story is all about uh, witches and magic and uh, uh, oppressive societies. I am referring to The Girl Who Drank the Moon by Kelly Barnhill, and that was published in 2016. For those who don't know, Kelly Barnhill is an American author uh, who uh, has published most of her work in the past 10 years. Pretty, pretty recent author. Um, she's also a former teacher, which is interesting. Um, uh, she uh, explicitly says that on her uh, on her website. And I think that's that's really cool how she like she might have like key insight into what young adults like to read, and so she's putting that into putting that like pen to paper and whatnot. Uh, and she she really seems to enjoy writing about magic and and fantasy elements. Um, uh, having a number of uh, uh, books related to that, especially the one that I'm going to be talking about today. So very thematic in her in her in her bibliography. Um, I would like to check out some of other th- some of the other things that she has written. I-, I wasn't exactly sold on the book that we're talking about today, but that's more on me. That's less to say you know anything bad about this book. It's just more my own preference. Uh, but I would like to check out more of what she's written because um, I'd, I'd like to see if, if something that she's re- written more recently is sparks like, you know, excitement within me, um, uh, may- maybe more so than what I uh, uh, read today. Uh, but th- but we'll see about that. Um, I, I will say that uh, I I will not, or, um, when I do my summary and analysis, analysis I'm going to avoid uh, summary or like spoiling the story in the summary section. I'm going to encourage you to go out and read this and then come back and check out my video. Uh, But in the analysis section, I might talk about a few spoilers here and there. Um, That's not to be avoided. So again, if you you, uh, don't want to have this spoiled for you, if you want to actually read this, which I might recommend it later, um, even with the caveat that I'm not, I don't personally enjoy it that much. Um, uh, just, just be aware of that. And so without further ado, let us talk about The Girl Who Drank the Moon. I will do a summary, a little bit of analysis, and we will move on from there. So The Girl Who Drank the Moon, uh, focuses on, uh, a, a sort of, uh, ancient, or maybe not ancient, but a, a different type of society, uh, either in the far past or in the far future, uh, where uh, there is an, uh, a society where, uh, or at least a city, uh, a town, a community, where uh, el- the elder, co- it's sort of ruled over by the elder council, who is protecting the, uh, the town from a witch. Um, who apparently uh, will uh, attack the town if they if they if the witch isn't given a sacrifice on a yearly basis, and so the town sacrifices a a baby once per year. Usually the the youngest baby, the one that, that was born the most recently, uh, they deliver it to the woods, and then the witch comes, takes it away, and and that's that. And at the start of the story, the elder council is taking the baby to the woods, um, along with one of their newest inductees, Antane. Uh, who is um, kind of hesitant to do all of this, is wondering why they just don't confront the witch and, um, and, and prevent this, this cycle of death from continuing. Uh, and, and they say that that's not really possible, that uh, nobody really wants to confront a witch. But we learn uh, uh, from Elder Gerland, uh, who is actually Antane's uncle, uh, that the, um, there is no witch at all, or at least they don't believe there to, there to actually be a witch. And so they're sacrificing the baby for the forest to come and get in, in an effort to make it look like there is a witch there and so that they continue to rule over the town and guide it in the direction that they're hoping to, to take it uh, and, and also reap the benefits of being in power all this time. Uh, but as, as it turns out, there is actually a witch that is 
um, uh, in the woods. Um, she encounters a, a baby every year and takes it to the nearby free cities. She doesn't actually know about this whole ritual process, uh, but she is taking the babies and uh, giving them to parents who are uh, very loving and caring, and uh, the, the process seems to be great, and those children are, are renowned as, as star children, uh, mainly because um, the witch, Zan, uh, feeds the, the children starlight in addition to regular food, which is a whole magical endeavor, uh, and it makes the children talented or magical in some sort of way. And so on the night in question, Zan encounters one of the newest babies, a, a, a baby girl, uh, who she names Luna, and she falls in love with, um, uh, which is which is very sincere and, and uh, very be uh, beautiful moment. Uh, but in addition to giving the child starlight, she accidentally gives the child moonlight, and uh, that enmagics the child. And Zan realizes the only thing she can do now is raise the child with the help of a delusional uh, sort of baby dragon and one of her oldest friends, a bog monster by the name of, of Glurk. Uh, but as it turns out, Luna is growing very powerfully, ma uh, magically, uh, over the course of the next five years. She's uh, like she's growing too powerful, and Zan is trying to figure out what to do. Meanwhile, the elders are beginning to turn against Antane because he he's a little soft on everything. He doesn't see the system as needing to take place, and he's actively avoiding any any time where he has to take a parent's child and uh, sacrifice that child. Uh, and so, like, eventually, they're, like, they're, they're, they're thinking of trying to force him out. Uh, and then meanwhile, uh, Zan is trying to figure out what to do with Luna, uh, and she's realizing that Luna is actually siphoning power away from Zan. And because she's 500 years old, if that happens long enough, Zan is just going to die. So, uh, 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 um, Zan wants to contain Luna's power. She puts her in a cocoon and then uh, blocks out the magic in her mind, at least until she turns 13, uh, which is which is all kinds of dangerous. And, and even Zan uh, acknowledges that. And even Zan says that like the, once once at, once she hits 13, that's going to be the end of the cycle, and Zan is most likely going to uh, going to die. And so anytime, but the, the 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 spell goes wrong, and so anytime Zan mentions magic at all, uh, like uh, Luna just her mind goes blank, and she doesn't retain any of that information. So Zan can't even teach her how to use magic properly in in this time. Uh, Antane is eventually thrown out of the. Um, out of the um, the, uh, the the elder council, um, and also comes into conflict with the the sisters of the tower, led by Sister Ignatius, who uh, uh, she's actually a witch that although other people don't really know, she's eating the the sorrow in the community that is that is built off all of this oppression. Uh, but Antine successfully turns to carpentry and marries one of the former sisters, uh, and they turn into somewhat of a of a power couple, challenging the 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 system at every turn. Uh, but um, as Antine notes later in the story, uh, Antine is, is set to give birth, and her child is going to be like the only child born in, in a period of time. So the youngest uh, the youngest child at that point. So Antine has comes up with a plan to basically try to kill the witch. Because um, he believes that the witch actually exists, uh, and the the council is a bit hesitant to do that, but they give the okay. But they also tell Sister Ignatius about this uh, in an effort to send her after him so that Antane can be killed. Because if he comes back with the child and there's no witch at all, that's going to raise a lot of questions, and people aren't going to be very happy uh, with the uh, with the council. Throughout the story, we also find out about a mad woman living in the the, the sisters of the tower, the, the tower that they're in, uh, who is actually Luna's original mother, uh, who was driven mad once the baby was taken away from her. And she's been watching everything from her tower, eventually breaking out and heading to the forest in an effort to find uh, this this young girl that she can feel, who's her sister, or her daughter, sorry, and um, also confront the witch, who she believes has stolen her daughter. Um, and then everyone proceeds to head to the woods uh, in an effort to either confront the witch or stop what's going to happen from happening. And Athene, who is uh, Antane's wife, uh, learns basically that the council has has structured all of this to happen and uh, sets of, uh, she confronts uh, Gerland and makes him feel small and she also goes to the the tower and frees a bunch of the prisoners and also confronts the sisters who are uh, trying to convince them to turn against the sister which some do uh, especially because she is a former sister herself 
uh, and uh, so it seems like Athene is is changing uh, the public's perception of um, of what's possible for them, and also preparing them to fight the oppression. And this is this brings a lot of hope to the protectorate, which kind of injures um, the sister Ignatius because she feeds on sorrow, and hope is is um, is is more hurtful to her uh, because she can't consume it in the same way. Uh, and that is a, uh, near where to the story comes to a close, so I will not reveal any more. I urge you to go out and read it. But again, in the analysis section, I might talk about a few spoilers here and there, so be on the lookout for that. In terms of analysis, there is quite a bit to think about uh, with with this with this book, it's a it's 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 quite an interesting book, a, a very well written, very beautiful book at times, with a few problems here and there. Uh, what's what's really interesting is one of the ideas that Kelly Barnhill talks about is, is sorrow, which uh, I, I think how she does it is really wonderful because this story, <laughs> as I was reading, I, I was like, wow, this story is a incredibly tragic story about death in disguise of like uh, a very happy, peppy magic story. Like she's not trying to hide it in any way, but the it, it kind of comes as like a Trojan horse where Kelly Barnhill is presenting you with a, with a story of some whimsy. And and like inside that story of whimsy is is sorrow, heartbreak, uh, acceptance of death, a wide variety of, of topics like that, and uh, especially uh, sorrow. Um, the the protectorate in general, uh, the 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 community is bathed in sorrow because uh, of what is happening to its people. They're being oppressed. They're uh, they're being told that there's um, there are monsters uh, lying outside the city that would w that wish to harm them, uh, and they're dealing with quite a bit of loss either because they're not getting enough resources to survive. Uh, the the elders are are frequently withhold whenever possible. Um, and their their children are being taken kick, uh, taken away from them, like. Uh, um, like uh, every single year, one 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 a newborn baby is just ripped away, taken to the forest where it's presumably eaten by by um, by the witch, or uh, according to the council members, like eaten by some sort of animal. Like nobody uh, nobody knows that there's there's actually a witch there. Like they they they've all been told, or the council believes that they're just outright lying. And so there's a lot of loss, a lot of sadness in this community, uh, and the um, like the the sorrow eater, which um, Sister Ignatius is is feeding all on all of that, which can only make everyone feel worse. Uh, there's an interesting quote that I would like to read to you about this. But oh, the sorrow hanging over the protectorate, and oh, the tyranny of grief, and oh, the howls of a mother driven mad by sorrow, the grief and pain that he had done nothing to stop it, even though he didn't know how. Zan could see the memory lodged in the young man's heart. She could see how it had taken root, calcified, inflamed by his own guilt and shame. And uh, that's uh, Zan, um, who's in disguise, sort of reading Antane at this point in the story, who has come to kill her. Um, uh, she's she's reading him, and she's seeing the the sorrow that that she feels. She sees the sorrow that everyone feels in the community, and she's also uh, becoming aware that she's been taking these kids who actually have parents. She didn't know about this before. Who actually have parents, and like like taking them to uh, to to other parents who who are experiencing a great amount of love. But it's not their original parents, and so she's sensing that 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 grief, the tyranny, um, as she says, the uh, the tyranny of grief, which is a very uh, extreme way to to. Uh, the phrase that. And so this oppression in this community, this sense of loss, is filling everyone with, with great sadness. And in some cases, it's leading um, uh, like people like Antane to do pretty extreme things, uh, such as seek out a witch and kill her, because then you can just, you can just end it all. Uh, at least that's what Antane thinks. Uh, of course, the, um, the, 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 the elders of the Protectorate uh, would, would hope to keep that quiet so that they can make it seem like uh, there's more reason to keep them in power, uh, and I, I yeah, I, I, I find it interesting that the uh, the sorrow eater, the uh, sister Ignatius, is feeding on all of this. 
uh, as a reason to keep more sorrow in there. So there's no real reason for her or for the elders to ever stop this cycle. They're going to keep it going for as long as they can because the elders stand to get gain in power and Sister Ignacia stands to live forever and, and feed off of this, uh, this constant stream of, of sorrow, which makes her a, a, a giant monster, in my opinion. Um, and it's really interesting also how Zan tries to protect people from this pain because she was also protected uh, from this pain uh, by the uh, by the magicians, by the sorcerers who took her in and sought to train her because she came from a, a lowly kind of sad background. And when they realized that uh, the Sora was kind of building up her power, they they tried to block it out for her. And I, she didn't realize that. Like, they, 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 they wiped her memory in the same way that Zan tried to wipe Luna's memory. And maybe that was bad because it led her to do the exact same thing to Luna. And um, I think Zan kind of realizes that once uh, when she uh, recollects her past. And... Um, I think it's. I think the the point that Barnhill might be trying to make is you can't really protect people from sorrow. Uh, like you can you can fill their lives with love and and hope, but if you try to protect them from the sorrow that they feel or block it out or or something like that, even if you mean well, it's just it, it's going to lead to further uh, further problems, which um, I'll talk about in a few moments. Uh, and and again, like as I mentioned before, like Barnhill is getting at like the idea of hope as the opposite of sorrow. Like introducing hope into the community, as Ethine does in this story, fills it with with love and actively fights uh, the effects of both the elders and the the sisters of the tower. I think it's also important to talk about the mistakes that are made by Zan in this story. Uh, some of the mistakes that she makes are taking the children, of course. She doesn't know that it's a mistake to do that, but ultimately it still is because the, the, those parents are suffering. And uh, even though the, uh, the, the, uh, the free cities are, are getting these star children, like those aren't, aren't their children ultimately. Uh, and she's also a, a magic Luna by mistake, uh, accidentally feeding her um, a, a moonlight. Uh, and she also tries to shield Luna from her own power by uh, sort of wiping her mind or blocking off her magical ability until she turns a certain age. But as Barnhill notes in this story, as, as Zan comes to find out, hiding the truth from somebody, uh, obfuscating reality, doesn't necessarily fix the problems that are are, are created, um, or they might even create more problems. So like if someone's suffering, you know, lying to them or, or trying to make it seem like that's not actually the case isn't going to make them feel better uh in in the case of shielding luna from from her own magic ability like luna's luna's still going to get her power at 13 and that's going to be what finishes off zan zan is going to die as a result and indeed she does in this story and if it's going to be hard for luna no matter what but do you want it to be hard for her now or hard for her at 13 when she's still a developing young young woman I feel it's unfair of Zan to, to, to sort of force that choice upon her at a later date. Um, especially like when, when they, uh, when, when Luna could like, like feel all that emotion like now and then like, um, ha have her friends be supportive for her down the road. Um, uh, especially because like in, in shielding Luna from everything, it doesn't really protect her from, like, uh, like it doesn't really protect her, like, or it doesn't really give her the ability to learn magic. Because anytime Zan talks about magic now, Luna spaces off. So she's created more problems than she solved here, uh, and that's that. That's very unfortunate. And I really like how Barnhill is willing to make Zan look look bad in this way. Like she's she's mistaken. She's fallible. She might be trying to do good things, but ultimately she's causing a little suffering for for the people in her life. Uh, like even when Zan learns that like the, the the children that she's been taking have had parents before, like she feels utterly terrible and it's it's devastating to her. And even the 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 free cities when they learn they're like oh wow that's that's not good that's 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 definitely bad. And presumably they're gonna they're gonna do they're gonna take steps to fix it. Um, but um, it's 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 really interesting how Barnhill is willing to make Zan look that way. Kind of noting how even people who could be totally loving and wholesome like Zan are like they can they can make mistakes and they can be fallible and i think that's a good message for for young adults to hear when they're when they're writing because not everyone that you love is going to be perfect 100 percent of the time but that doesn't mean that they're not necessarily worthy of love 
Barnhill also talks about oppression in this story. The Protectorate is pretty much a dictatorship because the elders control it, and the Sisters of the Tower give them the means to keep things in place. Uh, and, and the story of the witch, the myth of the witch, which is a large aspect of this, uh, cr the idea of creating stories and whatnot, like that, that, that story allows them to keep people in fear, which allows them to, to retain their power. Uh, elders are essentially controlling the population through this fear, and by uh, um, the, uh, sacrificing a baby each year by saying it's a ne necessary thing. So sort of like using their authority to... Uh, to force a, a, a terrible choice upon everyone, uh, but as as Barnhill notes, as as the narrator notes, as as uh, as uh, Ethine notes in the story, like hope can fight tyranny, like love love fights the the tyranny and oppression and grief uh, and sorrow and allows us to uh, feel positive again and and confront those who are making our life miserable. Um, and I think that's a really positive message, but at the same time, it's, there's kind of a wonky message here. It seems like there's an eagerness to forgive those who've done wrong in this story. Uh, it seems like, um, like, uh, Luna especially is like, oh, uh, like sister, um, like the, the sorrow eater, sorrow eater sister, whose name I'm briefly forgetting, like she's, uh, sister Ignatius, like she's, like, uh, she's just sad. Like, she's she feels a great deal of sadness herself. So let's not do anything harmful to her. Uh, she's going to she's gonna die anyways. And it's it's weird because she's been doing this for 500 years, and there you think there'd be a bigger effort to make sure she can't escape or that you, you actually keep her imprisoned rather than just letting her die on her own. And then uh, when they imprison Elder Gerland, they come to him and say, the new council has decided that if you apologize, you can be pardoned. But why would you want to pardon that man? He's he's taken control of this city for years, and presumably he would just keep this going perpetually until he died, and then the people who took control after him, like they would do that, and it would keep going and going and going, and uh, everyone would, would be full of sorrow and anger and hate and and frustration. And why would you be so eager to forgive Elder Gerland? Uh, it, it seems like you, if you re-accept him back in society, even if he apologizes, like those are just words at this point. Like he's done something so terrible and, and awful um, that maybe you can't forgive him for that, or maybe you can't just let him be a regular part of society anymore, uh, especially when he uses that much power to corrupt, because he might try to do it again down the road or in a different way. Um, I don't know, maybe this is, is a little too optimistic, or perhaps I'm being too pessimistic here, but I feel like that's a big gap in the story and one of the weaker parts of the ending. There are some other things I like about the story, such as the fantastic writing, which which really hooks you in. It's it's heavily emotional at times. Like there's sections where where you know I teared up reading it. Uh, the part where uh, where Zan falls in love with Luna and decides to adopt her right then and there is really beautiful. Uh, and the part where where Zan like realizes that she's made a grave mistake and gave Luna too much uh, magic, and now she's in magic and and things are going to be difficult there. And then the end where where Zan dies finally, and uh, Luna has to confront that and um, accept the death of a loved one, uh, and also watch some of her friends go away. Uh, that's that that's really hard to read, but it's a very powerful section, and it's. It's it's why I'm so confronted or conflicted about this book because there's parts that are kind of vague and unclear, and then there's parts that that where she just excels at her writing in Barnhill, and like makes me really love this, and uh, so I'm torn on it uh, a little bit there. And then the, the things that I don't really like as much are the are the vague plot where it takes a long time for anything to get kick started uh, because it's it's mainly just uh, Luna like dealing with her magical ability and Antane confronting. Uh, the elders and leaving the elders and stuff like that. But there's no inherent plot. It doesn't really kickstart until the last third of the book when everyone ends up in the forest and they they either have to fight Zan or Luna or uh, confront Sister Ignatius. And even she doesn't really become a factor in the story until the last third anyway. So it, it, it feels like there's a, there's a really vague plot, not a whole lot of struggle or conflict involved. Uh, maybe that's just because the everyone's dealing with, with with the conflict with love and hope uh, but even then I wouldn't ex like I don't expect people to start fighting it out but there needs to be some sort of struggle there where it feels like characters are in danger and it never really really does uh, and then the weak ending where like it it 
kind of just peters out with such a strong start and middle part and good writing. It just it just feels uh, like like Barnhelm maybe didn't know how to end it, and it it feels a bit incomplete in that regard. And I, as I always say, like a, a like any story like hinges on its on its ending, and this one it just uh, I don't think Barnhelm knew how to end it there, so it comes off as a bit a bit weak. Anyway, those are my thoughts on The Girl Who Drank the Moon by Kelly Barnhill. Uh, don't get me wrong. Like, as much as I say, like, I have, a, I have problems with this story, I do think I enjoyed it somewhat. Like, I thought it was what it, I thought it was fine. I thought it was uh, a fun read. Um, I don't quite understand how it won the Newberry uh, uh, and, and put on the same level as A Light in the Dark by Christine Soonturnbat and uh, Holes by Lewis Sacker. Uh, but I do think it's, it's, it's still a pretty interesting, pretty powerful read. Like, I think the uh, Barnhill's writing is worth the price of admission alone, and it's the reason I want to check out more of her work. So I don't know if I recommend this or not, uh, but if you see it at your local library, it might be a, a worthy checkout. Um, I, uh, and I, I do have to say, even though I, I like disliked it, uh, disliked aspects of it, like that's no way me saying it's a bad book. It just, it just wasn't my preference there. Um, anyways, if you read this before, if you liked it or not, uh, you know, comment below. Let's have a discussion about the girl who drank the moon. Otherwise, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe so that more people can find out about this book and this author if they do not already know. And until then, I wish you the best of luck in your weird and magical travels. Remember not to steal any children uh, that might have been placed in the woods because of an oppressive uh, dictatorship just one town over. Farewell.